Hi, I'm Mandy Medley. I'm one of the co-owners and workers here at Pilsen Community Books, and I'm so excited to welcome you here tonight for a conversation with Irma Almedo and Francis Aparicio in celebration of Irma's new book, Tales from the Barrio and Beyond. Just a few notes about the, how this evening will go. First, I'll introduce both of our guests tonight, and then I'll turn it over to them for a lovely conversation. And then there will be time for a Q&A at the end of the event. So if you have any questions at all um, for either of our guests tonight, feel free to drop it in the chat, and I will read the questions out at the appropriate time. Um, and now, without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's guest. Irma Almeida was born in Puerto Rico and moved to New York City with her family in the 1950s. She remained in New York City until she married and moved to Wisconsin. After obtaining a PhD, she taught at various universities, the last being the University of Illinois, Chicago. Irma is currently pursuing a second career as a fiction writer. She has published book chapters and research articles in academic journals on bilingualism, education, and immigration. She recently published her first book of fiction, a collection of short stories, Tales from the Barrio and Beyond. In her book, she capitalizes on her background and personal and family experiences, focusing on the Puerto Rican migration and diaspora. The themes of her fiction include issues of memory, childhood adventures, migration, and cultural conflict and change. And Francis, Francis Aparicio is Professor Emerita at Northwestern University, where she taught in the, in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and serves, served as director of the Latina and Latino Studies program for eight years. She has previously taught at Stanford University, University of Arizona, University of Michigan, and University of Illinois at Chicago. Her research interests include Latina and Latino literary cultural studies, the cultural politics of U.S. Latino and Latina languages, Latino and Latina popular music and dance, literary and cultural, tr cultural translation, cultural hybridity and transnationalism, Latinidad, and mixed Latino and Latina identities. She is the author of the award-winning Listening to Salsa, Gender, Latin Popular Music and Puerto Rican Cultures, and more recently of Negotiating Latinidad, Intra Latina and Latino Lives in Chicago. She has co-edited various critical anthologies, including Tropicalizations, Transcultural Representations of Latinidad, um, Musical Migrations, and the Rutledge Companion to Latino and Latina Literature. A founding editor of the Latino Studies Journal, she also initiated the Latinos in Chicago, Chicago and the Midwest Book Series at the University of Illinois Press to foster book publications and new research on Latinx in the Midwest. She is currently writing a book about Mark Anthony's most canonical songs as sites for critical reflections on identity, colonialism, race, and global solidarities. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Francis. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to be here today to engage in dialogue with my colega and Boricua compatriota Irma Almedo. Um, and uh, I want to thank Irma for the invitation and also Mandy Medley and the Pilsen Community Books, right, for hosting this dialogue. Um, given that this is Irma's book presentation, I think what I have done is prepare questions. Uh, Irma saw them and uh, I hope the questions will trigger important conversations about the the aspects of different aspects of, of the book. So a little bit about the book, uh, Tales from the Barrio and Beyond, uh, to me, is an example of the autobiographical fiction that has been so prevalent in U.S. Latinx literature. Uh, for decades, Latino writers have inscribed their memories of childhood, youth, and comunidad, right, in the U.S. through these fictional narratives. As the uh, title reveals, uh, Irma's short stories are part of this longer genealogy of growing up narratives in El Barrio, and I think it should be considered as part of this longer list of authors like Piri Thomas, Down These Mean Streets, Nicolás Amor's Nilda, Abraham Rodriguez, and other authors. Uh, these narratives, I think, are important because they serve as counter histories to the um, to the dominant official histories, right, that have long colonized our communities. And what I found most poignant uh, in Irma's short stories is this profound sense of cariño, right, this warmth and love that emanates from the narrator's voice, who is a young girl, who's Irma herself as a young girl. 
And so the sense of intimacy and love is clearly felt by your readers throughout the collection. So I want to thank you, Irma Gracias, for reclaiming the humanity of our Boricua and Latinx communities in the United States. So I'm going to start with the first question is um, having to do a little bit with your life story. I know Mandy already read a little bit of your general bio. So maybe you can let us know a little bit, share with us a little bit about some of the highlights of your life and which are some of the things that you thought were important to represent in the book. Well, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here as well. And I'm glad that we're able to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. It's fun to, to be able to talk about oneself and also what fun has written. Uh, Mandy did give a fairly uh, detailed uh, background uh, of my family and myself. We did come from Puerto Rico. Santurce to New York City, and actually I stayed in lo, lo, the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which Puerto Ricans call La Playa, until I got married and moved to Wisconsin. Uh, I lived in various other states after that. I lived in, in uh, Chicago for a while, I lived in uh, Ohio for a while, where I completed my PhD, and then ended up back here in Chicago uh, when the University of Illinois at Chicago offered me a position teaching in the bilingual teacher education department, uh, to which I was quite committed because I had been doing research on bilingualism in the city and a lot of the issues re related to uh, bilingual education. So I stayed here until I retired a few years ago. Um, in between, I had other nice experiences. For example, we spent a year in Germany, so I was able to learn German and that was kind of a treat. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I've, I've enjoyed being in academia. Most of my writing had been based on my research uh, on bilingualism and teacher education. And, but I, every once in a while, I try working out on a short story. And when I retired, then I had a little bit more time to write. And I you know, proceeded to write these short stories. And finally, I had enough for a collection. And I was very pleased when Floricanto Press showed interest in publishing it as a book and that's you know that's where it went mm -hmm. so i was very excited about that mm -hmm. so Irma, how did you decide to write about these particular stories and why did you decide to go back to your childhood right and to think about writing from that perspective um and did you feel a sense of responsibility as a puerto rican woman to tell your story well, initially I started out because we had a, a very interesting family, extended family. My mother had nine siblings, so that was a lot of relatives. And some of those siblings had eight to ten kids, so I have a lot of cousins. <laughs> and our house in New York seemed to be the hangout place for many of the relatives. Mm. So every weekend we'd have a full house. And part of what people did was tell stories. I mean, they just talked mm -hmm. <laughs> and they talked about their experiences frequently, their experiences in Puerto Rico, then their experiences coming to New York, funny experiences, sad experiences, most of the time funny. They seemed to find a way of, of giving it a funny twist at the end. So I had uncles and aunts who were great storytellers. And as a child, I listened. You weren't supposed to participate and in, get involved, but I listened carefully to a lot of the stories. And as I grew up, I remembered some of those stories and I decided to, you know, write some of them down. And also checking with some of the relatives who are still left over, uh, because sometimes you forget and memory is sort of strange. Mm -hmm. But I, since they're fiction, you know, I could play around, but I also wanted them to be based as much as possible on, on real experiences of real people that I knew and with whom I grew up. Okay. So you're kind of like the uh, the editor who takes these stories, right, and turns them into, into these beautiful short stories that we call fiction, but they're really based on some of the stories, right, of your own relatives and, and so on. So, which is an important project of recovery, right, when you think about it as a, as a Puerto Rican woman and a Latina as a Latina writer. So um, I know, I mean, one of the main focuses of your, of the foci of your, of your stories is family, you know, family rituals, celebrations, um, you know, breaking bread together, singing, playing the guitar, celebrating holidays, special moments. Um, so could you talk a little bit about why that, is, that has been important to you? Why did you also include that in the short stories? So many of these special moments. Yeah, well, that was, I think that was where most of the storytelling took place mm -hmm. when we all got together mm -hmm. to celebrate 
whether it be Christmas or a birthday or a baptism, and sometimes not celebrating anything special. I mean, Sunday was, you know, a place for hanging out. My mother didn't go out very often, but she loved to cook. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so everybody, everybody came over to our place. And so, uh, so there were particular experiences that, that stood out. One of the experiences about which you and I talked about, Francis, the last time, was the cultural clash when we came from Puerto Rico to New York. And mm-hmm. maybe I could share mm-hmm. a, little, a little abstract from one of the stories because it captures a little bit of that cultural uh, uh, culture clash when we first came to the city uh, in 1951. Uh, and and this, uh, this is based on the first story, which is uh, adventures becoming Americanos. What were we going through to become Americanos? So I'll share a little bit about this experience. Mm-hmm. And it's from the point of view of the mother, who would have, who would have been my mother. Nueva York in the 1950s was filled with many surprises for this Boricua. Even shopping at the huge, brightly lit supermercado, watching Americanos fill their grocery carts was an adventure. Products looked so fresh and attractive. And oh, the choices. Many kinds of oatmeal, for example, instant or regular, with or without sugar, cinnamon, or pieces of dried apple, in boxes or individual packets. The bread aisle was also a wonder with loaves of bread in all colors and shapes, white, brown, black, round or long, sliced or whole, sweet or sour, mixed with nuts or raisins. In my Puerto Rico barrio, I could buy either pan de agua or pan dulce and eat them in one or two days before they got stale. Americano bread lasted for weeks, packaged in plastic wrappers, decorated with pictures of healthy looking athletes. Unfortunately, the supermercado didn't have many Boricua foods. For that, I went to La Marqueta to buy platanos, spices for the sofrito, to season my Puerto Rican meals, and other products like Cafe Bustelo for surviving those frigid winters. What I couldn't understand was why Americanos ate dogs and cats. (laughs) <laughs> Cans with pictures of dogs and cats lined a large supermercado aisle. The hungriest people in Puerto Rico never ate dogs or cats. Dogs and cats could be pets, but no one went near abandoned strays. How strange to see so many well-dressed Americanos filling grocery carts with cans labeled with pretty smiling dogs or cats. How cruel to picture happy animals on food cans and boxes. Americanos son locos, that's for sure. I said to Cheito, they have crazy ways. <laughs> that was you know, yeah. one of those conflicts. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and, and I think that's also a wonderful um, selection to read to because you're not only talking about the cultural clashes, but also about the role of consumerism, right? For immigrants in particular coming into a big city like New York and having access to all these goods and resources and commodities and products, right? Mm -hmm. That perhaps on the island you were not able to find. So for a woman, for a mother, this is like amazing, right? It's such an, an important moment for, I think in some ways for empowerment, right? Um, and yet at the same time, you know, I think that consumerism plays a more, a very interesting role too in terms of thinking about citizenship and access to resources, right? Um, how much of the consumerism is also part of the imperial project, right, of opening up markets and, and increasing, right? people who consume, right? So anyway, um, so that's there's a lot there in that first short story, Irma, that I really found very compelling. So so moving on, I mean, I and I think this also brings up that first short story about buying, uh, brings up also the issue about the socioeconomic struggles for survival, right? Um, availability of jobs, right? Um, issues of poverty, but even language too, you know, how did you guys survive? Um, beginning to speak English, or did you speak English at, in the island already? You know, so could you talk a little bit too about how you know how how you guys did that as a family? How did you survive? You know, the economic struggles. Okay, uh, 
we didn't speak English at home um, in Puerto Rico. My father did because he had an eighth grade education. And when he was studying, they learned English in school. So he, he had functional English. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned English fairly quickly from my cousins. And then we were in a school. At that time, the Lower East Side where we lived, there weren't many Latinos and many Puerto Ricans. Mainly it was Jews. Uh, and so, in fact, in my third grade classroom, which is where I started schooling, there, I was the only Puerto Rican and the only non-English speaker. There were two other children who were Puerto Rican, but they were bilingual. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you know, in a sense, it was a sink or swim. Uh, but my cousins really helped us prepare us for the most important uh, learning at the beginning. And uh, third grade was relatively easy for me. My brother was in kindergarten, so it was relatively easy for him. And my mother, amazingly enough, learned enough English to be able to negotiate when she went shopping, <laughs> uh, because that was one of the things that you had to do in Orchard Street or the Lower East Side. You never, you know, you never paid what they asked for. You also had to figure out how to get it cheaper. Mm -hmm. That's good. And you have, you have a passage too about Las Navidades that you may yeah. want to share. Yeah, I can, I can read that one because yeah. one of the, one, as you mentioned, the issue of economics was always, always a problem. We were fortunate that in the 50s, there were a lot of jobs, a lot of factory jobs in New York. And so my father quickly got a job and my uncle who came to live next door to us also got a job. Uh, you know, obviously minimum wage, you know, a dollar an hour, you know, $40 a week. And that was what we lived on. But New York City went through stages where people were laid off or their hours were cut down. Mm -hmm. And those became really problematic, especially around holidays, especially around holidays, like Christmas was a big deal for the family. And so I'll, I'll read a section of that, of that uh, story. Uh, that story is the chick who came in from the cold. It was based on, a, on an experience of a cousin of mine who found a little chicken, a live chicken, and he tried to raise it in the projects. But uh, uh, this part is discussions just before we're preparing for Christmas. And my family was dealing with uh, some some financial struggles. Uh, how uh, how can we how are we gonna celebrate and buy presents? I heard Papa ask, sounding very worried. We kids weren't supposed to listen to big, big people talking. The kids only had to say what toys we wanted, and the three kings would take care of it. Or else Santa Claus, who brought toys for American kids. Wow, that would be really special to get toys twice, once from Santa Claus and once from Los Tres Reyes. Papa mentioned borrowing money from household finance. We could pay it back a dollar a week during the coming year. No, that costs too much, disagreed Mama. Always careful about family finances. See, but we need the money for toys and Christmas dinner, countered Papa. You know everyone will want to come over for Christmas. Well, we got to make sure we only get one present for each kid then, Mama suggested. Tony will be disappointed because he's excited thinking that both Santa Claus and Los Tres Reyes are coming and he'll get double the number of toys. Well, just tell him Los Tres Reyes don't come to Nueva York because it's too cold for the camels. Then we only have to get one toy for each kid. That was Tio Cheito, always working on an angle. How about dinner? <laughs> Abuela was already planning. I was thinking of a big asopao for midnight. But I'll figure it out. I'll figure out what to do. Abuela always had the last word. Friday before the holidays, we came home from school with all kinds of goodies, candy canes, Santa Claus and reindeer cookies and plastic bottles with water that made soap bubbles. The school Christmas party sure was fun. Even Miss Goldberg seemed happy, though she's Jewish and they don't celebrate Christmas. My sister felt sorry for Miss G, but all the kids called her. Can you imagine not celebrating Christmas? You don't get presents from either Santa Claus or Los Tres Reyes. And, and that was kind of a, a little bit of the discussion that took place among the kids and the, and the parents preparing for that big day. Yeah. <laughs> So moving beyond family, I mean, I think neighborhood and community is also a sense, uh, a, a space of family, right? It's family that we choose and family that we create. Um, and I think in some of the stories, you really uh, give examples of some of the stereotypes, conflicts, 
but also alliances and solidarity, the shared experiences, right, among immigrant groups in the area. And um, you, for example, mentioned the story about Blanca Antoni and in the intermarriage between Italians and Puerto Ricans, and also the story about Silvano, right, as an outcast and how he was perceived by you and your friends who were little kids at the time, right? You were scared of Silvano. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit too about that, what it meant for you to have this sort of extended family, which was neighbors and friends? Sure. Sure. Well, the story of Silvano uh, is the one story that takes place in Puerto Rico totally. Uh, and Silvano was a real person. Uh, and this is where my memory comes in, trying to resurrect those mm -hmm. pieces of my memory of this character. In fact, I remember as I was writing this story, calling one of my cousins who was slightly younger than me. And I said to her, do you remember Silvano? I was curious as to what she remembered. She says, oh, yeah, we were so scared of him. <laughs> mm -hmm. She had the same memory. So this was a, you know, a character from our neighborhood uh, that came into my store, into my, uh, one of my stories. Are you afraid of El Cuco or Silvano? El Cuco is a uh, bogeyman that almost every culture has one mm -hmm. of those characters where kids are afraid and parents use that fear to get their way. Uh, La Llorona would be the sort of a Mexican kind of, a uh, folk person uh, equivalent to that. Whenever Silvano sauntered down our street, we kids would scatter in every direction, hide behind our house, the nearest tree, or the rusted car chassis that we loved for our imaginary travels, or play hide and go seek. His matted hair that hung down to his shoulders was probably filled with piojos since he was always scratching it. His leathery face dried out from the hot island sun resembled a pair of old chanclas. His big blubbery mouth missing almost every other tooth looked like a caravela. His rotund belly might pop like a balloon if you pricked it. His long dangling arms with huge callous hands could easily squeak the, squeeze the air out of any kid whom he'd grab. The toes of his canoe-shaped feet stuck out of the raggedy boots he always wore. Most of all, we feared his booming voice that could be heard thundering for miles, even when he wasn't shouting. None of us knew what language he spoke, because it all sounded like gibberish. Silvano was scary. All the kids in the barrio knew that, and our parents made sure we didn't forget it. They manipulated our fear to accomplish their goals. If they wanted us to eat sancocho at dinner time, and we didn't want to eat that heavy vegetable stew, they'd say, remember that Silvano comes around in the evening? <laughs> we didn't need to say more. If we didn't want to come inside from playing when it was almost bedtime, how would you like to have Silvano join your little game or play hide and go seek with you? If we were shouting too loudly and they wanted to talk quietly to one of the neighbors, Silvano sure knows how to quiet kids down. <laughs> Sometimes when we were naughty, Abuela would threaten us with calling El Cuco, the boogeyman, but we weren't afraid. Who could be afraid of El Cuco, whom we'd never seen, when we knew, when we knew that Silvano was always roaming the barrio? El Cuco was imaginary. Silvano was real. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was that was a character. And, and uh, the story, uh, obviously, I won't tell the whole story, but we were curious as kids as to where Silvano lived and what his life was like. And so he followed him. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what happened, you have to read the story. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good lead, Irma. So um, twist and <laughs> It had a twist ending. <laughs> yeah, it does. So, which is really nice. So, um, so my last question, in spe you know, specific question, um, has to do with memory. And you mentioned earlier how you know memory plays a game on us. You know, sometimes it's not really reliable. It's a composite of, me you know, things that we remember, visual recuerdos, and things are usually come together in 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 fragments sometimes. Um, and so I was thinking about if you could talk a little bit about that in terms of what is the role of memory for you um, as a Puerto Rican woman, but also in the larger scenario of, of colonization, right? How do colonized subjects use memory as a decolonial gesture? 
and particularly through writing. And I'm thinking specifically, you went to in, you were you lived in New York in the early 1950s throughout the 50s, and that is the decade of West Side Story, right? At the end of the of the decade. So, I think you know your your collection of short stories really does a wonderful job of of undoing, right? And of deconstructing a little bit some of these dominant narratives of Puerto Ricans, you know, in terms of criminalization and, and racialization. So, so could you talk a little bit that about that? Yeah. yeah, let me let me say a little bit about memory because you know when you get to be my age, <laughs> you really do think a lot about how things happened in the past. And mm -hmm. I I spent a little bit of time of, uh, in the 1990s doing an oral history with some of the family, some of the relatives, interviewing some of the older relatives. Mm -hmm. And I, I made that into a whole project in which I also engaged my students uh, and teachers to try to get to encourage them to do projects on oral history with with their students and their own families. So uh, so I was able to resurrect a lot of stories that, you know, I had forgotten or I had not lived through mm -hmm. uh, and, and supplemented some of the things that I experienced with some of the memories of other members of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I'm, I'm working on a memoir. And so I'm doing a lot of reading just about writing memoirs or how, you know, a memoir is not a, a, an autobiography. You know, how does one portray important episodes in one's life mm -hmm. that will be of interest to others and not just, to, you know, my immediate relatives who or mm -hmm. my daughter or my children, my grandchildren. Uh, so so I'm kind of learning about that. Uh, this this uh, this was my first effort mm -hmm. to write about this. And so my hope is that if. If you know people enjoy this so far, I'm getting good feedback about the book, mm -hmm. that I will extend it to write, you know, write a longer uh, piece. And based on, uh, I mean, a memoir seems seems a good one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there were interesting episodes in, in my life that, in a sense, correspond to, to other immigrants and mm -hmm. other women who tried to balance marriage and career and mm -hmm. family and commuting, commuter marriages. I mean, there were a lot of issues that, that I think are fairly current, not just for me as a Puerto Rican woman, but for me as a professional mm -hmm. uh, and, and as, as a member of the diaspora, because I left, I left New York and, you know, really recreated my life in northern Wisconsin. That was a, that was a big change from the <laughs> lower side of Manhattan <laughs> to northern Wisconsin in January. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of adjustments, but I mean, you, you keep coming back to the past, and I, I think I was I was blessed with the mm -hmm. fact that I had you know a mother and a father who were at home. I had aunts and uncles with whom I was able to interact. Many cousins. I mean, our social life really at the beginning was more with cousins. I long for parties with young men who were not cousins. <laughs> Most of the time, they weren't there. It was mainly extended family and it was fortunate that we had enough extended family who shared many many of our experiences and so uh so i, I do think that resurrecting memory uh is really important there is a story i wasn't going to share much about that story but uh you had read it it's about a cousin of mine uh uh her uncle died my 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 uncle yeah her uncle because she was a cousin her father died Mm -hmm. She searches in the 1990s for us because she had lost contact with the rest of the family. And that's a really nice story. She told me what she went through to try to find us. And I was fascinated by her telling me the story. And so I recreated it as a short story. Mm -hmm. so, so that was also a way of resurrecting memory from the experiences of someone else that I had not lived. But mm -hmm. I to you know, use the pieces that I knew and the pieces that she knew to form a story about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Irma. Is there, are there any other final comments you would like to make before we open it up for questions and answers? Uh, well, I just want to say that you know, the, the book the book has a is a nine short stories. Uh, seven of them uh, took place either in, in New York or Puerto Rico. Uh, the last two stories took place in Chicago. They're also based on real experiences, uh, and they're not based on El Barrio, uh, but experiences uh, as, as for me as a, as a professional woman, uh, a Latina, in, in the context of Chicago. They're a little bit different uh, than the others, but uh, they're all fairly short. 
Uh, so the book is accessible, <laughs> uh, relatively easy to read. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the final marketing. <laughs> right. Anyway, so so Mandy, you want to take it from here? Sure. Um, there's a few questions here. One person wants to know about the difference between um, writing fiction and academic writing and which one you enjoy more. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a great question. Okay. Uh, and it's not a matter of enjoying more because they serve different purposes. Mm -hmm. As a professor, I was doing academic writing based on the research that I was conducting in education, in children's bilingualism, in immigration. And so when, when I wrote those kinds of articles, I had to document how I got the data, how the data that I got compared with others in the field. Uh, uh, I had to make sure that what I was writing uh, ex ex extended out from the research that other people had been doing to make it really interesting. Uh, and so most of what I wrote really uh, as a professor was that kind of writing which got published either in book chapters or academic journals. Uh, fiction I don't have to document anything. <laughs> I can just write for the pleasure that people get. I don't have to quote anybody officially. I don't have to have footnotes. Uh, and so that gives you a certain amount of freedom. And, and there is more, you know, can you enjoy it? Can I make it enjoyable? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to say anything profound if it's fun. It can also be profound, but the, but the object is not so much to be profound as to, as to give pleasure in what one writes and, and, and get pleasure myself. I do enjoy, uh, you know, making dialogue, trying to create a dialogue. I remember people, but of course I don't remember everything they said, but creating the dialogue as to what they might have said. I'm, I'm having fun doing that now with the memoir because I'm, one of the sections of the memoir was finding love. And I talk about how I met my, my husband. And so I put words in his mouth uh, in terms of that section. And, you know, it weren't the exact words. They were what he might have said. But it's been fun writing it in such a way that, that I enjoy it. And it, it feels like it might have happened. <laughs> That's great. We have another question here. Um, someone comments, Francis, that is a brilliant observation how colonized people use memory as a decolonial practice. Uh, Irma, could you tell us more about how you see the memoir in relation to stories or autobiographies? Yeah, yeah, and that's, and that's one of the issues that actually I'm working on now. I've just, I signed up for a course this semester at the university, creative nonfiction, precisely so I can learn academically <laughs> what I can do with, with, with memoir, because it's, you know, it's something new to me. I've been doing a lot of reading of memoirs, uh, but it's one thing to read, it's another thing to tackle it yourself. In terms of how these become a decolonizing project, I mean, I think, I think we have unique experiences as part of our own lived experience, and some of those experiences may connect to those of others, and, and also those of other immigrants. And so when I discuss our coming uh, to New York City, uh, you know, in 1951, what kind of neighborhood was that in? What kind of neighborhood? How did we manage to function in that neighborhood? How did we interact with people who were very different from us? Uh, and also, you know, things might have been very different from the way they're portrayed in history books. Mm -hmm. So let me give one example. When we move from the tenements to the housing projects, uh, the housing projects were being built, they were new, the tenements were being torn down. And I remember 1956, how joyful we were to move into the projects. Everything was clean. We had a, a bathroom inside the apartment and, 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 and a shower. And, and all the appliances were new and there were no rats and no roaches. So, I mean, you know, when you think about the projects, it was only as an adult that I began to hear how people thought of projects as being another slum. And people who lived in projects as being, you know, gangbangers and, and drug addicts and things like that. I mean, when we moved into the projects, it was moving up in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and it was such a change from the tenement projects that were being torn down. So it's another perspective from the historical perspective that may be portrayed in, in sociology 
uh, analyses. Uh, this was personal experience and it was the experience of many of us. Now things changed over time and trying to identify the causes of those changes or uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated and this is where the, you know, this is the academic journal or the academic writing comes in, doing the research, uh, explaining it, documenting it, all of those pieces. Um, kind of related to those changes you mentioned, someone asks, if a Puerto Rican family immigrates to, oh, I lost it, to the U.S. nowadays, how similar or different do you think it would be from what your family experienced in the 50s? That's a wonderful question. Yeah. And a lot of people are migrating from Puerto Rico to the mainland. In fact, there are more Puerto Ricans now living in the mainland than are living in Puerto Rico. Uh, obviously in the fifties, you know, many of us moved because there were very few jobs on the island and there were jobs in the city. Uh, and there was a, you know, a political move also to push, push us out. And that's a very complicate, complicated, complicated, uh, 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 situation. But, uh, we've, we've had a lot of Puerto Ricans moving, I'd say in the past three, four, five years because of the hurricanes and, uh, I think I think one of the similarities is that we when we came in 50 we already had relatives living who had moved to New York in the 40s and so they were able to help us get established and that's a similarity I think for a lot of Puerto Ricans who've moved recently they generally have relatives uh, in the states who are able to you know help them get started and orient them so that's a similarity a difference I'm trying to figure out how they would be different uh for some of them, it might have been much more difficult to leave the island because they may have had homes uh, in, in Puerto Rico. They may have had uh, jobs in Puerto Rico, and, and much of that might have been sort of destroyed uh, because of the of the uh, the hurricanes and all that. I mean, when we left, uh, it didn't make sense to stay. There was just nothing there for us, mm -hmm. uh, and we we just needed to escape because mm -hmm. you know we you know we, we could hardly eat. Uh, uh, but for these people, you know, maybe more comfortable giving up their homes, giving up the schooling for their children, um, may really be more, more difficult. Uh, one thing maybe is easier is many of them have moved to the Orlando area and the greater Orlando area and Kissimmee, that area is Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. I went to visit relatives. I have many relatives who, who participated in the circular migration movement, which is people who came in the forties to New York then went back to Puerto Rico in the 70s, mm -hmm. and then in the 80s ended up coming back to the States. So I have a, a whole lot of cousins who live in the Orlando mm -hmm. Kissimmee area. And that's, you know, when I went to visit, I could not believe all the restaurants, okay? I mean, you can get anything that you get in Puerto Rico, you can get there. So I think if they move there, there's not that many changes for them between living in Puerto Rico and living in the Orlando Kissimmee area. Uh, even the weather is somewhat similar, whereas for us it was really a culture shock going from going from Puerto Rico to New York City. Mm -hmm. There was nothing there uh, as a community that we were able to be a part of. Thank you. Um, another question is: uh, Someone wants to know what authors were an inspiration to you while writing these stories, either Puerto Rican authors or uh, just any authors. Yeah, well, when 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 Frances mentioned Nicolas Samor, uh, you know, she was mm -hmm. she was excellent. Um, oh, when the Garcia girls lost their uh, Julia Alvarez, just mm -hmm. in terms of her writing, okay, also a motivation. Uh, the memoir, and, and these are more, these are more recent. I, I'm trying to remember what I was reading then that motivated me there. But more recently, I you know I've read uh, Sonia Sotomayor's. Uh, memoir, which is wonderful, and another Sonia, Sonia Nieto, who's an educator. I read her memoir, uh, also wonderful. Um, when I was Puerto Rican, uh, Santiago, her name was. I Esmeralda. Remember. Esperanza Santiago, I think. Her name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I found that also uh, uh, interesting and motivating. Um, yeah, I want to think about that some more. Who was I reading then when I was writing these stories that may have motivated me to write in this way? I'm, I'm having a... Did you read Rita Moreno's memoir? Yeah. Oh, yes, a wonderful 
wonderful. Yeah. It's now I wasn't reading. I wasn't reading those when I was writing these stories. Many of those I've read subsequently. Yeah. Because the stories were written quite a while back. The stories just got published last year, but I had written these stories, you know, quite a while back. And some some had been at least two or three had been published, but in academic journals. And and so the you know I had I had to rewrite them to kind of make them more accessible in terms of a book. But there's a lot. There's a lot of literature out there. I've, I've I've noticed Floricanto Press is publishing a lot of Latin American literature. I didn't even know that press before they published mine. And every once in a while, I look now, and they're, they're publishing all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of also a lot of young Puerto Ricans that are just writing a lot. I mean, I'm constantly amazed when I look I look at these books and I'm like, oh, look at this. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wish I could start all over again. <laughs> Well, that's perfect, because that leads into our last question, which is, do you have any advice for other writers just starting out um, who want to write fiction or maybe even memoirs? Yeah, well, I would say listen to other people. I mean, if, if you're interested in writing, you know, let's say a family or memoirs or anything like that, listen to people. Uh, listen closely uh, to how they tell their stories or what stories they tell. Uh, a lot can be learned just by focusing on your listening because they've got to come from somewhere. They don't come all from you, from you alone. Uh, read, obviously read as much as you can and read in a different way. Read as if you're thinking, okay, how did this author start this to get my attention? You know, what is the first two, three sentences like? How does it capture my attention? And then how do, what's the structure of the story? How do they move from one episode to another episode so that it, you know, maintains my interest? Uh, I think that's also that's also important uh, as a way of, of learning, you know, learning how to improve one's own writing. I would say if you have, have opportunity to take courses on writing fiction or even, you know, creative nonfiction, uh, there's so many opportunities in almost all universities. Uh, to take courses and learn from from others, either people who have been doing the writing or people who who can give you tips on how to write. I didn't I didn't do any of that for this for this book, uh, and and I know that I'm learning a lot just in the course that I'm taking now. That I mean I I think I could rewrite these stories in a different way because I was I would be very conscious of those kinds of questions. How do you how do you attract a reader? You know how do you hook him initially or her? Uh, how do you develop the storyline so that you highlight what you think is important? How do you end it so that it's you know satisfying? Uh, and then what, what can you cut? Because sometimes you write, 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 and then you need to you know cut some things out because otherwise a story is not a short story; it just goes on and on and on. So <laughs> how do you focus and and and, and get rid of stuff? Uh, it's wonderful to have word processing where you can revise and revise and revise because it, it really takes a lot of revision uh, uh, to the point where you say, okay, I think it's, I think it's good enough. Mm -hmm. And then having readers, having people who will read your stuff, I'm, I'm having a hard time with that. I'm not getting as many people giving me feedback as I would like. Uh, uh, but I did, I get some interesting feedback from some relatives who read the stories and they said, Oh, that didn't happen like that. <laughs> or, or, or was that was that your father that you were talking about? <laughs> they want, because they want to make it, you know, they want to make it nonfiction. And I say, well, if it's fiction, <laughs> they want it to, you know, to be exactly the way it did. It, it happened. I have one little story uh, that I talk about, you know, uh, supposedly my mother cooking a can of dog food and making spaghetti with it. <laughs> And, and all the family say, I didn't remember your mother doing that. <laughs> when did your mother cook a can of dog food? <laughs> but it's interesting. I was I was sharing that story with some with some some of my students, and there were a lady in the class, an older Jewish woman, who said, Oh my God! In the Jewish community, there were many stories about people cooking canned <laughs> canned food, <laughs> including <laughs> dog food. Because I didn't know any, you know, so I thought it was a fairly common immigrant experience <laughs> among other immigrants. People mm -hmm. didn't know. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, listen, listen to others, uh, share and, and, you know, be open to feedback, learn, 
if you can, by taking courses, by reading other literature, by reading, you know, self-consciously in terms of uh, methodology, how, how does this writer do this? Uh, what, how, how can I improve it? Great, that's amazing advice. Thank you. Um, any final thoughts before we say good night? Is there much time? <laughs> I would just want to say that Irma is an inspiration to many of us who have recently retired and who know that you know that we can continue to do this kind of creative work, you know, even even at our as we age, right? That there are a lot of experiences experiences and memories and things that we have lived, right, that can be important to share with others, with younger people, younger readers, and with the world today. So, so I want to thank you, Irma, for continuing to write. Thank you. And I think, you know, I think it's important for those of us who are in academia, where our context is so often with younger people who are trying to figure out, okay, their own route, okay, their own uh, academic route and also personal route. If we've had a fairly good life, you mm -hmm. know, that we can share some of what's good, even if we had difficulties and we were able to manage those, mm -hmm. uh, to share some of those uh, difficulties and some of those challenges, uh, to see that, you know, it, yeah, it's a struggle out there, mm -hmm. uh, but that we have strengths that we need to, uh, you know, capitalize on and not, not give up so easily. Well, thank you both Irma and Francis, and I look forward, Irma, to hosting you hopefully in store when your memoir comes out for an event. I would love to have you back. Um, it would be great. But thank you both for joining us digitally here tonight. Um, and with that, I will say good night. Thank you, Mandy. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Buenas noches.